Good evening and welcome to a virtual studio visit with Ursula Hudson. I'm Mary Savig, the acting curator and the Lloyd Herman Curator of Craft at the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Renwick Gallery. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Native communities who make their home here in Washington, D.C., the Native people who on, who, on whose ancestral homelands we are gathered, and the labor of the people who were enslaved in constructing the historic buildings of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Renwick Gallery. At any point in the program tonight, please use the Q&A box to ask any questions. We will share key information with you throughout the program via the chat box. We also ask that you not close your browser window as a survey will appear after the program, and we really appreciate your feedback about the program tonight. This program is being recorded and will be available on our website. The Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Renwick Gallery is a nonprofit organization that relies on private donations. We're able to share free digital programs like the one today, thanks to funding from generous supporters like you. Please consider showing your support with a donation today. A link to donate will be posted in the chat box. So tonight, I really want to thank Ursula Hudson and everyone who's behind the scenes work made this program possible. Here at the Renwick Gallery, we're really grateful for Sam's program team of Zawadi Carroll, Lindsay Canis, Lisa Chamarchenko, and um, Mary Lesher, who all have helped this program run really smoothly. So I'm here to introduce Ursula Hudson. Ursula Hudson is one of the six artists featured in our latest Renwick Invitational, Sharing Honors and Burdens, which will be on view through March 31st. If you cannot make it to the exhibition, please visit our website for some fantastic com content, including artist videos. Ursula draws on her experience in graphic design to weave original Chilcat and Raven's Tail styles of, of Clinkit textiles. Her striking designs subvert convention, twining together elements of traditional garments and high fashion, and elevating the strength, beauty, and resilience of the women who wear them. From her Colorado home studio, Ursula's work tells the present day, ever evolving story of Clinket culture and the land. Tonight, we'll hear more about Ursula's life and career and then tour her studios, gaining personal insight into her exquisite practices. Now I'm pleased to turn it over to Ursula who will begin the program with a brief introduction to her body of work. Welcome Ursula. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for the introduction and everyone at the Renwick. Karusne dechat duasak daktaintan ayachat kasha yihit yidach. My Klingit name is Karusne, which means they are weaving as in that them over there. Um, and I think that's just a really accurate description of how I relate to my creative process where I feel that the work that is being made is being done so through me from people from a realm beyond. That, it doesn't want me to continue. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I'm predominantly a weaver uh, following the Chilkat and the Raven's Tail traditions of the indigenous people of the North, Northwest coast the Pacific Northwest. And um, these, these techniques are more aligned with basketry versus conventional weaving traditions. Um, and this is a weaving in progress, which probably looks a little different than the, the other modes of weaving that you may have seen. This is that previous weaving completed. And it's a, it's a chill cat weaving. And you can identify Chilkat weavings because they have these curvilinear shapes that aren't, these soft curves aren't really possible using other weaving techniques um, because there's usually this like stepping down or brick, brick stitching. Um, more similar to this. And this is a raven's tail weaving um, using pretty similar techniques to Chilkat but all of the patterns in Raven's Tail are, are geometric, similar to basketry. And these weavings are uh, almost twice as fast as Chilkat weavings. 
This is a Raven's Tale ceremonial ensemble, and I combined contemporary Raven's Tale patterns with clinket basketry patterns and used basketry techniques in both the dancing shawl, the blanket, um, and the collar, and crochet on both as well. I'm also a painter. I combine traditional clinket motifs um, with all the other influences from my diverse experience as a hybrid, <laughs> um, a, a cultural nut. This is uh, that painting I was just working on. This is a 36 foot backdrop created for a music festival, an indigenous music festival. And I got to make it with my family. And you can see it's featuring this like customary chill cat design. And um, here it is all lit up at the at the festival this past September. And you can see the stylized chill cat form line design. So the form lines are those black stylized shapes that Northwest Coast Indigenous people are known for all up and down Pacific Northwest Coast. Um, and you might, they might be familiar to you um, from like uh, totem poles and canoes. These are my parents. Um, they're, they were both full-time artists growing up when I was growing up and they worked together on a lot of stuff, did some really cool monumental work and they modeled to me um, what, it, what it meant to make contemporary art following traditional technical and spiritual protocols. This is my mom. Clarissa Rizal Hudson, um, Clarissa, Clarissa Rizal by the time she got divorced. Um, she was a weaver of Chilkat and Raven's Tale also, and also an artist of many, many mediums. And here I am with my sister, Lily Hope, and my mom in 2016 when they started teaching me how to weave. And uh, <laughs> weaving takes a lot of patience and I didn't have any of that until I was 28 years old um, but I did grow up around it and so when I did start this is my first chill cat phase it, it came it came pretty easy there was a lot of information and technique that was passed through osmosis um, but Lily and I's our, our mom passed away six months after they taught me how to weave or they began teaching me and I live in Colorado uh, 2,000 miles away from Lily, who lives in Juneau, Alaska. But thanks to Zoom and FaceTime, uh, Lily's been mentoring me for the past eight years. I'm pretty grateful to have such a prolific weaver in my family. And I was homeschooled for most of my formative years. And I was uh, around my parents all the time. And so they, they kind of steeped me in cultural vibrancy. I was uh, um, indoctrinated into making art in a really culturally centered way. So there were always like aunties around and fellow artists. And that really taught me that community is an essential component in art making. So we make art for more than just aesthetic purposes, but for the community building that happens during the creative process. Uh, the process, you know, offers time to build respect and trust with one another and um, establish a really strong sense of place and belonging. And we make our art a lot of the time for celebration. Um, it's made to move and interact and it it's made to honor the spirit and so art is an essential component to upholding this um, animist worldview where everything has a spirit and everything is alive and everything is integral to the entire mechanics of this existence. And making regalia really involves incredible levels of care and awareness for tradition and the future. And so the training that all of us weavers receive is centered around 
that care and intention. So when I go to weave, I ask who needs this power that resides within the regalia. And so as ceremonies are changing in this hybridized society, um, I make regalia for women in a contemporary context and specifically weaving pieces to fit the female, the female frame. And that's not traditional. Weavings take a really long time and therefore were usually uh, historically only afforded by clan leaders and clan leaders have historically been men. So in our modern society, uh, as women are taking these higher positions and leadership roles, I have been weaving garments to honor and elevate the modern woman who has never had this type of regalia. And there's um, there's like a renaissance, there's a renaissance of indigenous cultures globally. And we are bringing artwork, work, artwork back into ceremony and into new cultural environments into new geographical locations and activating the work and the spaces in a in a new way. Um, I started making these smaller weavings and designing these black environmentally and ethically sustainable garments to accentuate the woven component components. Um, and these pieces are worn on runways. They've been shown in Canada and the United States at um, at galas and advocacy events and red carpets and in stoic photo shoots and hung flat in cases um, and statically displayed on mannequins. So over the past couple of years that I've been exhibiting my works, I've been blessed with these opportunities to see how this work can transform moments and institutions that I hadn't considered bringing this work to in the past. These like events outside of the Klinga context, but still reminding me that this work is alive no matter where it arrives and, and it's meant to move. And it, and it has the ability to activate spaces that really need the spirit more than ever. And I have seen how my painted work has had a significant energetic influence um, on artists and audiences and transformed like a rock show into a ceremony. And so I've been become very intrigued by the question, how can we create more space for ceremony in a world that is deprived of spirit? And how can exhibitions be dreamed anew and bring the work down from the wall and off the mannequin and into movement? And how can we transform the way that institutions care for work in a different way by honoring all that it has to offer us beyond just that visual aspect. So right now I'm exploring contemporary variations of um, these traditional shapes in collage and ink and paint and exploring abstraction and color and um, organic shapes, um, plant shapes and melding masculine and feminine energies and then applying it to my weaving. Uh, this is a, a seaweed uh, wall hanging. Um, that's very contemporary. And I'm testing out different materials um, and shadow and drawing from Klingit, bas um, Klingit beadwork. And just, these are just experiments for like larger performance and, and ceremonial backdrops. And I'm playing with uh, contemporary crest designs that I haven't really, we haven't seen and um, layering, uh, layering of shapes and combining the contemporary with the traditional and then bringing those experiments back into my ceremonial regalia, um, back and forth, back and forth. And that's it. Thank you so much. We're going to, manage a complex transition to another screen um, so we can see the first of two of Ursula's studios. The first is her weaving studio, which is in her home. And then we're yes. going to move to another studio. 
But first, here we have Ursula. We can see you. It's great. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All right. So here I am in my weaving studio, which is half of my bedroom. Um, and half of my weaving studio is my office. And um, and here we are at my desk. I'll show you some of my inspiration that is influencing my work right now. So I have these, these, the stack of books. Um, the first is this book for healing our spirit, the Clingit oratory book by Nora and Richard Dauenhauer. And um, I'm reconnecting with my roots. Um, I live very far away from Alaska. So this book has been really essential in me understanding something that I knew but needed to be reiterated, which is just how much Klingit people think in like a holistic way that's centered on, on nature and um, just the oral histories that are spoken in here um, really demonstrate how we think of this world in a really poetic way with lots of metaphors using the natural world as our reference and our and our teachers. Um, that's that book. And then I have this little stack of Filipino children's books of folk tales because I'd never really even considered um, incorporating my Filipino heritage into my work before this year. And um, through some encouragement, I have just begun exploring um, Filipino stories. And I thought I should start at the very beginning with children's books. So yeah, I spend way more time here than anyone, anyone should. And I actually really love office work, so it works out for me. But I spend a lot of time here researching um, indigenous theory, indigenous art theory, um, journaling, um, planning, sketching. When you're doing research, and are you thinking- We will just move right on to, oh. I think I have a little bit of yeah. a delay. Is this okay now? I was just I can asking- hear you. Okay, there's, I think I, we have about a 10 second delay. Um, when you are doing research, are you thinking of metaphorical or poetic designs for your work? Are you thinking of new subjects or is it more um, and, and or a combination of just thinking of how you're going to bring this in, these intentions to your practice? Hmm. Um, a lot. Of, so for my research, I'm trying to understand um, why I, why I am the way I am, um, how I got here, how we got here. And I, I'm researching how other people are currently thinking about, um, Indigenous art and, and how artistic concepts can inform action. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, I'm just delving into conceptual work at this time. And then the imagery kind of just comes out of that organically mm -hmm. um through sketching lots of like just making myself sketch and seeing seeing designs and shapes come come forward um mm -hmm. that's a really exciting process I, I I don't try to force anything I just try to let it come come out mm -hmm. could we see your loom yes well they're next so here it is the little guy um so it's it's less like a loom and more like a, mm -hmm. a frame. We have mm -hmm. the header bar here. And I I usually stand at my loom. Um, the tension is created through gravity vertically. These warp ends are just hanging to the ground, but then we create tension horizontally with our fingers. Um, this warp is merino wool with cedar bark uh, thigh spun into it which is 
the cedar bark is traditional. Um, but traditionally we use mountain goat wool, but mountain goats aren't as easy to come by these days. And uh, merino wool is plentiful. So could you, most could we you were... talk? Oh, sorry. Could you talk a little bit about thigh spun wool? Yeah. Um, so thigh spun wool, you take two two plies of of wool roving, um, very thin, about the thickness of one of these. So two strands of that, and you place it on your thigh like so, and then you add a little strip of cedar bark to to each side and then you spin it together so they're both twisting in the same direction but then when you come up they twist together and if you're if you're fast you can do about a yard in an hour and so this is really valuable stuff <laughs> yeah um so this is going to be a shawl this is going to be a spider woman shawl for the Gotchman family. And you can see there are three sets of eyes here. One, two, and then these tiny little dots, and then an eye on either side. And then you can see I'm almost done twining the sixth, uh, the, the sixth legs, mm -hmm. and there'll be two more. Um, and then I'll get a little bit closer to give you a little demonstration. Demonstration. Let's see how close we can get. Let's see here. That looks pretty All good. All right. Good. All right. So for the weaver section, so I'm these weavers are two two strands and they run back and forth horizontally. And they you kind of step down and step over to create different shapes. And so there's a strand in front and a strand behind, and the one from behind goes in front and twists with the one in front, and the one in front goes behind. And so you're just twining around sets of warp bends, just like a basket, if, you've, if you're familiar with that technique. And, and then you twine over these braids. So the weavers make the shapes, and then we employ these this braid technology to outline the shapes, and that's what creates the curves. So in order to create these two white lines right here, when, which I'm going to mimic down here, I have eight sets of braids just to do those two white shapes, white lines, and each set of braids has three strands. And so slowly, after you, with with every, every few rows that you weave, you begin dropping down one strand slowly. And so you're very, very slowly braiding vertically. And you you we do we do braid diagonally and horizontally, and that's a little bit quicker. But that's where the magic happens. And it's very technical um, and very slow. And so there, therefore, you'll find that a lot of chill cat weavers and raven's tail weavers are pretty nerdy. We uh, we really thrive on problem solving, and it's kind of an an anxious um, technique to, to work in, um, and and I love it. And all of us weavers, yes, we're, we're nerds. Um, well, it's clear here. this oh. takes, it, it's clear this takes probably many, many years to just learn the techniques and become familiar and comfortable with them. How long does it take to, how long will it take to make that work? Oh, yeah, this, this has been on my loom since August. Um, if I had been working on it full time, I could have finished it in three, three months. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm a pretty quick weaver. Uh, if, if I were to make a full size chill cat robe with the design field that big, then, uh, it would probably take me a year. 
and it takes others it, like working full time and it takes mm-hmm. others less. My mom probably could have done it in six months and um, uh, my sister could probably do it in six months and other weavers two years. Depends mm-hmm. on how quick your fingers are and how much Netflix you watch while you're weaving. <laughs> <laughs> so over here is my, um, here, I'll, I'll step back a little bit. This is my altar space. And I feel like I really wanted to share this because prayer is such an important component to weaving Chill Cat and Raven's Tail um, or ceremonial work because you have to put good intentions into your work. The weaver's energy goes into the regalia and then the regalia adorns the dancer and the dancer feels the energy and the energy of the weaver and the dancer combine. And then their audience or their witnesses of the ceremony are then affected by that energy. And then they take that energy out into the world. And so it's super important that we pay our respects to the powers that be that be that give us that grant us this privilege to weave this really important work. Um, All the things in place from how our lives are configured to who's in our lives to support us. Um, And so we pay our respects to our ancestors and think of our future generations <laughs> and slab, just oh. fill ourselves with gratitude yes it, it, this intentionality that you're placing into the work in the catalog you and your sister really beautifully described this head as heart work could you describe that a little bit more hmm I don't know. I don't know if I can go into that right now without taking okay. up too much time. No worries then. <laughs> um, maybe we'll get into that a little bit later during Q&A. Um, but here, I'm going to try to share what's on my altar. Um, uh, I have my most used tools, which let's start with the hem gauge. This thing is super important. Uh, you got to measure our shapes to make sure that they're the same size size on both ends. Um, So I use this dozens and dozens of times a day. Um, This is my my grandmother's scissors. And let's see, we have some heart-shaped pins that hold up my, hold up my braids out of the way and continue to infuse the work with that heart. Um, some darning needles. These are really important. They um, they allow us to tuck these little strays up and out of the way. But let me show you this craziness. For every shape or color change, um, you have a, a, a few sets of braids that have to get tucked back after you close up a shape. And they get tucked back <laughs> to to make up this mess back here. And let's see if you can see on both sides. And so at the end of the weaving process, some people do it along the way, but I wait until the very end and then I tie up all my braids and that all the braids needling up is going to take me probably two or three full days of work. So that is a process that you have to learn to get to love. Um, and then this little chest of drawers here, I'll show you really quick before we leave my weaving studio. Um, this is where I'm keeping my smaller weavings. Um, I've been keeping them in the plastic vacuum seal bags because I had a moth infestation a few years ago that totally freaked me out. I tried to freeze everything to kill all the larva and freeze it again. And um, now I'm pretty careful with how I store my stuff. And so, yeah, I'm keeping my, my woven works in here. Oh, and then on in here in this box, I have my favorite 
yarns, my favorite um, weft yarns, which are silk. I love working with silk because it's so, so beautiful and luxurious and shiny. But traditionally we use merino, or not traditionally, traditionally we use mountain goat wool. Um, but most weavers are using merino wool um, weft yarns because it, it cl more closely matches the mountain goat wool. And with silk, like you have to weave twice as many rows to get the same distance on your weaving mm -hmm. um, because, because they just slide up next to each other. Uh, but beauty is pain. <laughs> <laughs> so now we'll take you out of my office weaving studio and down to my painting studio where I'm doing all my explorations. And I wanted to show you, give you a walkthrough of my house on the way there because it's such an essential component to my creative practice. Um, this house is 120 years old, so 124 years old. It was built in 1900. And my mom got this bought this house as her dream home in the 90s and passed it on to me when she when she died and um so I've been walking the same streets and gardening the same land for most of my life which has really opened up or offered me the security and comfort of of, um, I don't know, just being really held and being familiar with my outside world so I can delve into my inner world and take risks in my art. And so this is my backyard. We're seeing an untimely uh, spring right now and you can't see the mountain range, which I really wanted to show you back there because it's beginning to snow, thankfully. We, there's usually at least a couple feet of snow right now, by now. And this is the studio that used to be a garage when we first moved here. And my dad converted it into a studio for my mom. And now I share it with my husband. And he is a sculpture artist um, and a musician. So this is his zone over here. And you can see we have different aesthetics the red carries through the red and pink um and this is where his band practices and i've been playing around with some music um and i'm tucked back here this is where i've been making messes lately clean right now for you all <laughs> i'm gonna situate you right here and right now i'm working on painting studies that are helping me explore set design. And so I'm really wanting to uh, do this production. I am dreaming up a way to make um, a completely female driven performance ceremony celebration. And the process in doing that is I am looking to the performances or celebrations and ceremonies that have been really formative in my life. Um, just down here, down south in contemporary situations and up north and deconstructing them and trying to identify the ways in which they have been influenced or shaped by pa patriarchy, both traditional Klingit patriarchy um and contemporary you know settler colonial patriarchy and identifying them to become really conscious of them to then flip it and completely saturate the performance ceremony a celebration um with feminine energy and so i'm working on the set design the regalia or costuming and um uh the the full production and in here i'm working on uh doing these studies trying to work through studies quickly to like to find that feminine quality for backdrops and so um I, i'm playing with wallpaper designs and 
abstract form line and and doing that with oil painting and acrylic. Um, so let's just see. For example, you saw this one in my slideshow. This was a round painting that I thought about. It's a study for, I thought about putting it on the ceiling and <laughs> having it be a sort of portal, but um, ultimately thinking that it would be applique, that white would be a cloth applique on top of a sheer material, I'm working with transparency and opacity. Um, this painting, which I'm not quite sure about, not finished, um, it's another paint, uh, oil painting study um, on collaged paper. Um, and you can see I'm playing with these seaweed shape, um, uh, kind of trying to get familiar with how these shapes want to interact and move together. Um, thinking about sheer mat material, organza and um, chiffon and and really embracing the shadow and the light of it all. And over here, take you to these collage works. Um, the oil painting was taking way too long. <laughs> so I was encouraged to try um, collage because I'm really familiar with um, exacto knives mm -hmm. and and collage as well and so I started cutting apart all these pieces and piecing them back together like puzzles and that was really fun just to to play with contrast and texture um, and kind of imagine like these were fabric even though they're paper um, and here's some of my materials for maybe backdrops but I think I'm going to get started next week on regalia um, I'm using in here, I have some folk patterns that I found in my mom's stuff um, that I really want to see if I can execute them. Well, that's a kid's, a child's folklore. I want to see if I can execute them with like 80s glam, glamorous materials, um, which is why I bought all these sequins from the 80s. I have all these fine uh, trimmings and sequins and buttons, um, all vintage that I was playing with for my backdrop studies um, in cloth, in textiles. But now I've been putting them on my collages, and that's been an interesting process. I'm not sure if I'll keep doing that, but it has been fun. Um, in here we have some. <laughs> Let's see, those are some media, uh, painting mediums and solvents. Um, oh, down here, we have some collage materials, a big mess of scraps here, some Japanese papers, um, gift wrapping paper, some old silk screen prints of my parents, um, wine labels. <laughs> Uh, books, you know, like Michael Jackson and like cats and maps and stuff. And I just want everything to be available for me when I need it. <laughs> so that's part of my goal in this studio is to just like keep everything that I need on hand for when I need it. Um, and here we've got lots of drawing pads, different papers for drawing and painting more pads. Ugh. Um, I have some wood panels in there too. Oh, sorry, I'm in the in the light. Oh, and this is my favorite drawer. This is all my large mm -hmm. Japanese paper, which uh, makes me feel so rich. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I want to show you my my this sign. This sign. Um, in high school, m m my friends and I would all come in here and make a huge mess of my mom's studio. <laughs> and so she had these signs get made. I have one sign here and one over here um, to re remind us to clean up after ourselves. But my mom was just so good at cleaning up after me that I, I never really learned. <laughs> so I'm still <laughs> trying to learn. And so I am implementing these different efforts um, 
techniques to to try to keep this place tidy for her because she's still ever present with me and um, keeping tabs on me. Um, and so one of those efforts um, are these craftsmen's. Um, they have the top that opens so I can keep that open while I'm working at the table. I have my printmaking supplies here, my most used printmaking supplies. Um, let's see, are you close enough? Can you see inside here? Oh, um, I love the colors. organization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got my colored pencils so I can work at my table and keep this open and then just put my colored pencils away while I'm working. Um, uh, paint pens, paint markers, uh, just random pastels, watercolor pencils, anything that I might need at any given moment. Like, don't, don't interrupt me because I don't have the materials. Like, I need to have all the materials on hand. Um, let's see, I have a bunch of like glue and scraps and random stuff down there. Oh, I'll bring you over here to this other craftsman while we're talking about it. <clears throat> All right, let's see. This guy, uh, oh, it's stuck. That has wires and stuff in there. My paint palette, I love keeping it here while I'm working because then at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I'm just like, boop. <laughs> that Most is useful. so smart. Yeah, thank you, mama. <laughs> I, I feel like sh I should give her credit for that. Um, oil paint, let's see. Uh, acrylic brushes, oil brushes, uh, solvents and cleaners down there. Um, let's see, we'll go over here. This is my map, my map cabinet that I am keeping my prepared materials in. These are collage papers that I've prepped by measuring out where I want to do the collage in advance and doing a bunch of them in advance again so that my process isn't hindered um and uh, anytime I need to do a collage I just get to it no excuses um in this drawer are the papers that are already pre-torn but don't have the format already laid out because sometimes I like to extend my work beyond the format but I still need them torn and ready for me printmaking papers on this side uh let's see this is like finished studies um here's kind of an abstract floral design I was working on with its sister um just playing with texture and contrast and um getting to know these these shapes better since they are new to me but also familiar in a way this is a cool gouache study that I was working on last month um where I was kind of trying to combine my cubist influence from my parents with um, Klingit um, beadwork design and uh, exploring interconnection and movement in a really um, obvious way. Those were fun, real fun. And then this fourth drawer and below, which I'm not gonna show you, are all my failed attempts or studies that I'm abandoning. So I was trying to explore like in this one, I was trying to explore embroidery mm -hmm. and outlining these shapes with embroidery. And it turns out that that is not that. <laughs> and it's also not conducive to like making these really flowy lines that I wanted. This is a mono print, another failed attempt. Um, mono printing is just too messy to be fast. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know. I don't even know. Let's see, I think, oh, this, this little guy over here. I love these drawers. This is all about process too. Um, so in this top drawer is just my rulers, but when I'm working on my collages and I'm making a big mess and it's time to go to bed, I have learned to just shove all of the papers that I might still use in the future in here 
like this paper where it tells you how to be a good wife and make a good pot roast and how to make good potatoes um, and potato chips, but also how to wax satin and felt a hat. So I need those papers for the future. I'm not gonna throw them away, but I'm not sure what to do with them yet. Here's some Japanese scraps from another collage I did that I will use in the future. Um, oh, this is a collage I was working on and I, I got bored with it and I'm not sure I want to abandon it. So I just like, I'm tucking it away here mm -hmm. <laughs> just in case. Yep. And so I think that's it. I don't know if we have any more time, but. Yes, we um, have about 12 minutes. Thank you so okay. much for that tour. I think um, watching you open drawers is ex is so exciting. It's kind of like watching a game show with what's behind the curtain. And you are impeccably organized. I'm wondering if your daughters come in and make a mess. Oh, yeah. I didn't show you their spot. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I haven't... Uh... I haven't figured out how to instill the lessons that I'm still learning onto them. Um, uh, trying to motivate them with my dissatisfaction doesn't work. <laughs> They'll get there. Yeah, they have they have an art studio over there, and mm -hmm. uh, our youngest, who's nine, she still comes and works with us sometimes. But my fourteen year old, you know, she's off in her own world now. Well, I really appreciate seeing the oil painting of the movement and hearing you reference a, a material like organza. And it brings us back to the beginning about the intentionality you have around movement. I'm wondering, have you tried incorporating some of the materials in this studio, like the sequins and organza itself, into your weavings? Hmm. Hmm. No, I did think about putting sequins on a weaving once, but um, all those voices come in that say, don't put something that's plastic on a weaving that takes you a year to weave. <laughs> um, and I haven't figured out how to silence that voice yet, but I have experimented with um, making like a button blanket robe mm. with organza and sequins. And that was edgy for me because I did use silk and tried to apply it to organza um, and, it, and, and the materials weren't really talking to each other well. And I got some feedback on there that kind of scared on that piece that kind of mm -hmm. scared me away from exploring that any further this past winter. But I will go back to it. And mm -hmm. I am. And with that spite, that round portal ceiling painting, I was intending to use organza and sequins on that. Um, mm -hmm. So so maybe not for a, like woven regalia, but I definitely intend to bring the glamour of the 80s and the, the cheap materials of the 80s into a different type of regalia that, I, that aren't, isn't necessarily for ceremony, but mm -hmm. it is for performance and um, and celebration in a different way in a with a with the future with the future of indigenous people in mind right and for that matriarchal performance you're planning it sounds wonderful and i'm wondering if it will be at a museum space is that the plan and just continuing this work of pushing museums to include movements and activation as part it's and, see, and understanding that as part of the work itself yeah, I mean, I'm trying to allow myself to think as big as possible with this whole production idea. Um, so I have definitely thought about museums in the vision because I have been involved with museums recently. Um, uh, but I'm also open to other big venues and mm -hmm. and and it's definitely not just me that mm -hmm. is going to be in, involved in this production I mm -hmm. I want to I want all my heroes I want mm -hmm. to pre create a production that has a clear enough vision and image to draw in all the indigenous 
women who have been an inspiration to me who I may have not met in person yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the perfect gathering. I have a great audience question about your color palette. Um, specific to your weavings, could you describe your choice of using black and white if it's symbolic or aesthetic or related to mm -hmm. um, the material itself and the fleece or dyes? Yes, traditionally, a Chilkat weavings are black, white, uh, goldish yellow, and um, either green or, and, or blue. Um, and then Raven's Tail weavings are traditionally black and white with a little, a little bit of yellow. Um, did I say that right? My Raven's Tail was mostly black and white. Um, but I've been really into like the bolder basketry patterns that aren't really traditional to Raven's Tail or like these kind of contemporary Chilkat form line designs that aren't super traditional. Um, and I guess I'm just more motivated by seeing what I can do, what's possible, what maybe I shouldn't do as opposed to trying to recreate um, historical pieces, which a lot of weavers do, um, and I probably should do more of. Um, but I gravitate towards black and white, maybe because I love black and white, but also because I am, I, I used to be a graphic designer mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. prior to COVID, and it's all about contrast and weight and I I really love balance and um and yeah the contrast of forces like light and dark and just the yin and yang mm -hmm. uh, concept. So I try to like incorporate equal amounts of black and white into most of my work, mm -hmm. but it's not really that intentional. It just happens. Mm -hmm. Related, there's an audience question about: Do you make different weavings to particularly fit? specific reasons maybe for yourself or the recipient that holds personal meetings meanings absolutely mm -hmm. um my first couple ensembles I wove for me like I didn't have any woven regalia I had my mom's button blanket robe and tunic and really immaculately beaded regalia but I didn't have any of my own woven regalia and so I wove them to fit my body. Um, but then when they were finished, I realized that they didn't really feel like they belonged to me. And I'm moving on to the next ensemble, which I still plan to make my own regalia one day. Um, but for example, that Spider Woman shawl, I, I, I knew that she was going to have a big life ahead of her and she had the ability to infuse a lot of people with her energy and and so I was really intentional about the imagery um spider woman um I imagine you know as a, as a weaver she mm -hmm. is able to step back and see the big picture and spin together all of the various realms and aspects of this world that a lot of people miss because they're so focused on one thing spider woman draws all together and sees all and and has the bigger picture of you know the web that is that connects us all in mind and mm -hmm. i really wanted the wearers of that piece to understand how interconnected we are mm -hmm. and so that is my hope for that piece so a lot of prayer went into that piece and that helps us i I think understand how interconnected both of your both of your studios are because even the work that you're planning with a larger group of women also shows this idea of interconnectivity and how you're yeah. just able to weave all of these things together to show a bigger world view for everybody and I really appreciate that. I'm going to ask one more kind of technical question before we close out. Um, are the weavings planned entirely ahead of time or just a few inches at a time? Hmm. Yeah, it depends. Um, I have a red ensemble that I call Matriarch Rising, and that piece was completely planned ahead of time. Um, all the patterns, the pattern for that 
apron of that, that ensemble um, is a smaller version of one of my mom's robes. And the collar piece um, was a uh, improved version of a previous collar I made. But the blue ensemble that I made, my first ensemble, that now is, it's still a, on view at the Renwick, but it, it's been acquired by the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, that robe didn't know what it was going to be until like, like a half an inch before it turned out that way. So like the entire pattern just unfolded like I, I, I was following a pattern that was in a, um, a Raven's Tale book that I have by um, the Raven's Tale Weavers Guild, uh, led by Kay Parker up in Juneau, Alaska. Um, so I was following that pattern, but it kind of inverts uh, every few inches. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't know that that pattern was going to be the whole design field. I thought it was just going to be the border. and the message that came through with that finished piece was really profound to me. Um, it was, it's just talking about, yeah, how we're all intertwined and interconnected mm -hmm. and how all of we, we, um, time is, you know, happening all at once and we're all come, mm -hmm. we're all connected throughout time. Well, thank you so much, Ursula, for giving us this really wonderful picture into your studio practice and into your really wonderful um, creative life and we're so proud at the Renwick to have your work on view and we can't wait to see what you do in the future. Um, I just want to give a sincere thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Please remember to go to your browser window and complete the survey. Ursula Hudson's work will be on view in the exhibition Sharing Honors and Burdens through March 31st, so we welcome you all to visit the museum before it closes. Thank you so much and good night, everybody. Thank you.